Hi guys, Grand J here and welcome to our final video in the Opus 6 set review. Today we'll be talking about the light and dark cards. So let's finish off the series and check out these last four cards of the set. So first of all, we have Hate Hraes Velger, which is a six cost, 9,000 power forward. When Hraes Velger enters the field, select one of the three following actions. Skip your opponent's attack phase during their next turn. Remove the top five cards of your deck from the game. Choose one character in your break zone, add it to your hand. Or remove all cards in your opponent's break zone from the game. So this card's actually an interesting card, and I think that this card is something that people kind of sleeping on a little bit. Um, so if we look at it in terms of like the priorities of his abilities, um, like his most default ability is that choose one character from your break zone, add it to your hand, which makes it effectively a four CP nine K forward um, that allows you to uh, allows you to cycle a card from your hand. Um, for one in in your break zone so straight up that's like not too bad by itself um stat wise and like effect wise what it brings to the table um and so like if the other two abilities aren't ever relevant you're, you're always guaranteed effectively a 4 cp 9k um but he has two other additional sort of uh, abilities that can be handy in niche situations um so yeah the first one is you skip your opponent's next attack phase and remove top five cards uh from your deck from the game so obviously um yeah if you if you do this um you do shorten how much time you have um, in the game because you're removing top five cards in your deck, which is effectively like two and a half turns or like effectively three turns um, of the game that you shorten your clock by. Um, but you do get to skip your points in the next attack phase. Now, obviously you want to play this, in, like you want to play this um, before your opponent has a really powerful turn or a turn where um, you're unable to defend or really critical turn fundamentally, right? Um, which in this game actually happens more often than you think. Um, so w when the game has like drawn out a little bit longer and you're both sort of mid-rangey sort of decks, um, both players have usually like dealt three to four damage to each other and they have a board of usually like two to three fours each, right? You can attack with one of your big guys, um, your opponent will let it through, um, and then maybe you can attack with them, uh, with them, uh, you can attack with your middle sized guy, and maybe they leak it through it, but it puts them at six damage, and they got three guys that are very safe against defending against your smallest guy, right? But then that puts you in a situation where your opponent just like slams through like fr uh, free attackers, and you lose the game, right? Because you're like f four damage. Um, so yeah, this can break stalemates in that, like, you can attack with some of your guys, your opponent lets it through, and they know that you can't lethal them, and then you just chuck down Praise Velger at the end of your turn, um, and then your opponent's like, oh, cool. And it's like, uh, like, like, so it's like your opponent's like, oh shit, um, I can't attack back on my next turn, which means that um, now I'm forced to be on defense again, right? So obviously your opponent can still like cast spells and destroy stuff, um, but your opponent yeah, just didn't, doesn't get to attack you. Um, so yeah, it is able to break stalemates in that if you play it well. Um, I think it's like, it's really difficult uh, and you have to have a really good sense and planning of the game in order to use this first ability uh, effectively. Um, so yeah, so it, it, it is a powerful card, but I think it's one of those cards that it's, um, only, yeah, only more advanced players or players that have like a better grasp of the game can really use effectively. Um, it's third ability of remove all cards in your opponent's break zone from the game. Um, this is obviously very, very, very matchup specific. Um, although like, um, we, we are seeing a lot more, um, cards interact from the break zone with like multiple colors. So obviously hitting water is pretty solid, um, in that like you, you're preventing them from, uh, recurring stuff from the break zone, whether it's summons, forwards or monsters, um, Against lightning, it's uh, uh, quite reasonable as well. It, yeah, it stops them from recurring stuff with like Sage, um, or like it stops cards like Zemus from being able to use their ability effectively. Um, yeah, against fire, it stops them like it stops like it removes their Phoenix targets. Against ice, it, it removes devout targets. Um, so yeah, so in a lot of uh, in a lot of cards, actually, um, the third ability is relevant, um, but obviously it doesn't have any impact on the the current game set or the current board. Um, so it only is like prevents your opponent from using certain specific actions against you, right? Do note um, against certain colors such as like fire, when they have Phoenix, if you use Phrase Velger to remove all your opponent's stuff from the break zone, your opponent can always respond by using Phoenix in response to like um, grab grab a grab a forward back in response to this effect, right? Um, I guess like um, other little niche things like if your opponent's playing like an Arch Fiends deck, um, such as my, my mate, uh, Demarcus Williams, um, this is a hard counter, right? So your opponents like put like all four different types of arch fiends in their break zone. Um, and now they, they've got free gold bases. You play this card. Cool. They have to start all over again. Um, and considering how they run less of certain arch fiends, it's much, much more difficult to, for your opponent to like cycle all those things back to the, back to their break zone again. Um, so yeah, so this card actually has like a lot of utility. Um, and I'm actually interested in trying him out. I don't think he's as bad as people give him. 
um, are, are, are saying that he is. Um, and at the same time, he like he opens every element to having some sort of um, break zone recursion. So certain colors, um, such as um, such as um, wind to a certain extent um, and water to a certain extent, um, they don't really have too many ways that they can bring stuff back from the break zone um, back to their hands um, to use like S abilities or to have like more more copies of those forwards. Um, so yeah, Hraze Velga does give you the opportunity or the option to pull those cards back. So um, for example, if you are playing like classic uh, Riku, uh, Riku Yuna Pain, um, you only have so, so many Barts and you have so many Pains in your deck. And as soon as you run through them, you like your your deck runs out of like its high value frets. But Hraze Velga does allow you to recur some of those. Um, so you can have like, you can play the fourth copy of it effectively. Um, so yeah, so this card opens up a lot of options. It's a strong utility card. Um, if 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 the game did have a sideboard, uh, then I definitely would uh, expect to see this card um, having a place in certain sideboards. Um, but yeah, so this card I think is solid, but it's like it's a little bit metagame specific, and it's a little bit like element specific as well, like with the the sort of decks that you want to play with and uh, how often you're going to use each one of those abilities. Next we have Materia. She is a 4 CP light backup. So Materia can be played onto the field even if you control other light characters. You can play two more light characters onto the, onto the field. When light uh, when Materia enters the field, you may search for one light forward and add it to your hand. Um, so yeah, let's break it down. So the first part is basically, yeah, while you've got a light forward, you can put her into play. So there's no restriction there. You can put her into play anytime. After she's on the field, you can have multiple light characters on the field. So um, that's a very similar effect to Opus 1's Cosmos. Um, and it's for ability of, yeah, when it comes to play, you can search your deck for a light forward. Um, and add it to your hand. Do you know it says light forward, not like light character or light card. So you can't grab Ultimish, uh, you can't grab um, uh, Ultima, and you can't grab Cosmos um, with this. But um, that being said, though, um, there are a lot of fantastic light, uh, light forwards. Um, and this actually allows every element to search for um, light, light cards uh, that are relevant to the deck. So, um, and typically the light forwards tend to be very category specific. Um, so for example, Light Zidane is F, uh, FF9, uh, like FF9 specific. Um, Warrior, uh, Warrior of Light, the Light Warrior of Light, that's not from Opus 2, that's like Warrior of Light like specific. Um, Terra, um, an yeah, another way to search for Terra. So a Materia actually like does allow you to search for quite a lot of different options. Um, and it gives you just a searcher um, for those specific light cards that you want to see more often in those sort of decks. Um, so yeah, so it, it's like at base level, it's just a searcher. Um, at a higher level, like the fact that it allows you to play multiple um, light characters on the field opens up certain arch archetypes again. Um, so in Opus 3, we did see this uh, semi-competitive, fun, like almost like real competitive, like water light deck. Um, where it was running multiple light cards like Warrior Light and Zidane's and it was just like constantly uh, using them to play uh, cheap Ultimas. Um, and yeah, I could definitely foresee like Materia um, slotting into that deck uh, very well. Um, yeah, so uh, do note that a, a big difference between this card and Cosmos is that Cosmos can be dulled for uh, any CP, whereas Materia uh, can only be dulled for light CP. So don't consider it as a um, alternative for Cosmos if you're playing a multicolored deck. Um, but yeah, other than that, this card like is pretty solid and I think it's its value comes more from the fact that um, you can search for specific light characters for decks that don't have existing ways to search for those light characters uh, currently. And here we have Spiritus, which is the dark um, the, the, the dark variant of material. So its effects are all exactly the same, except they're all specific to dark characters. Spiritus can be played while you have dark characters on the field. You can play more uh, two or more dark characters on the field at a time. And when he enters play, you can search for a dark forward and add it to your hand. So um, Spiritus, arguably in the current metagame, is probably more relevant than Materia, simply because um, Camelot is quite strong at the moment in the metagame. Um, and obviously you want to get Camelot before you get your other dark forwards. Um, so Spiritus allows you to search for Camelot, So you can play Camelot, and then Camelot has dark targets that he can um, search for. So um, yeah, so Spiritus does have does tend to like be more playable simply because Camel Law exists. And Camel Law can search for other dark forwards, um, which whether, uh, which is probably going to be Emperor, but potentially could be Dark Kefka as well. Um, and Spirit of Slash, you have both Camel Law and Emperor on the field at the same time. Um, whereas Materia, if they're searching for a light forward, generally that light forward is going to be um, very specific to that sort of deck archetype and you're not running multiple different light forwards. You're not, it's very unlikely for a deck to be running Zidane and Terra or Cloud and Zidane and multiple of those because those are usually um, very team or deck specific. Whereas Dark, a lot of the Dark cards um, 
um, are generally not category specific or like ha can be just chucked into any deck for a pretty imposing uh, ability. Um, so yeah, so Spiritus, I think because of how flexible dark cards are and how dark cards right now are searching for each other a lot better, um, Spiritus will probably see more play than Materia. Um, but yeah, um, definitely that, that being said though, um, if you're not running Star Sybil, um, then may like if you're not running Star Sybil, then Spiritus has more of a play because Star Sybil can search for Camelot. Um, but yeah, if you're not playing Earth and you want to get that Camelot out because he's such a strong play, then Spiritus actually is uh, not a bad option for doing that. And the final card of the set is Nidhogg. It's a 9 CP forward at 9,000 power. When Nid Nidhogg enters the field, your opponent randomly removes one card from his or her hand from the game. And when Nidhogg enters the, f uh, enters the field, choose one forward, your opponent controls, remove it from the game. Um, so this card, like people originally thought that this was going to be one of those cards that you want to like, um, that you want to combo with Legendary Renoa, double its ability, um, and so on. So obviously like um, I'm in Ice, um, there are quite a lot of abilities that have um, have this way to like basically repeat a forward to enter play ability such as Renault or such as Time Mage. Um, that being said though, I feel that Nidhogg is way too cost restrictive um, for what it does. Um, so yeah, the fact that, yeah, cool. So when it comes to the play, you get to randomly remove one card from your opponent's hand from the game um, and you get to kill one of their forwards, right? So let's look at randomly remove one card from the game. Um, so this is the first time we've ever had like a situation where um, you get where you randomly remove a card from your opponent's hand from the game, um, but that's not actually the best um, discard effect, right? So obviously the the weakest discard effects are your opponent gets to choose because your opponent chooses the least useful card in their hand, right? Now randomly means that you might choose like the best card or the worst card in their hand, right? There's actually like in wind, especially uh, quite a few of the Zidanes, where you get to look at your opponent's hand and select the card from their hand, right? And that's the most powerful discard effect where you get to choose um, arguably the best card in their hand or the most impactful card in their hand, right? Nidhogg is like, is in between those two effects. So Nidhogg's randomly remove a card from hand is like, is not the most powerful discard effect. It's actually like the middle ground discard effect, right? Um, yes, it does remove it. Um, so yes, there there is a little bit of benefit in that your opponent can't, like find ways to recur that back to their deck or their field or their hand. So there's a small benefit to that, but I would much rather have an ability where I get to look at my opponent's hand and get rid of a card as opposed to randomly getting rid of your opponent's cards. Um, so yeah, so I think that first ability, like the discard ability is, is a little bit weak considering that this is a nine CP, uh, nine CP forward that we're putting down. It's second ability of, yeah, just like removing uh, one of your opponent's forwards from the game. It's also a little bit weak. Like I, I think that like if it was just like remove a like uh, remove a card your opponent controls from the game, I think that would have been fine. I think that would have been fair. Um, yeah, like having the ability to like blow up a backup monster or forward um, as that second ability, I think would have been. Uh, I think that would have been fair for the cost of this card because when you compare this card at nine CP, um, you're comparing it to like cards such as like Raided and Bahamut, um, which are things that like just destroy two forwards on the field. Um, and yeah, and so like Nidhogg, I feel that this card like is over costed for what it does. It just kills a guy, gives you a 9k body, and your opponent discards a card randomly from their hand, right? Um, but you had to spend nine whole CP to do it. So that's five backups and two discards, or like three backups, three discards, right? Um, so you're you're definitely discarding two cards at least to get this card into play, right? Just to discard one card from your opponent's hand, put a guy on the field, and then kill one of your opponent's guys, right? So even though like if you break it down into its components of, oh yeah, cool, we've got a... 9k body, which maybe we can we can say is 4 CP worth, right? You randomly discard a card from your opponent's hand, which is maybe like 2 CP worth, right? And then you get to kill one of your opponent's guys, which is like kind of maybe 4, f between 3 to 5 CP worth of value, right? So it's like f like 4 or 5 CP plus 2 CP plus 3 to 5 CP. So that's like maybe, depending on how, like, depending on how, you, how high or low you rate it, that could be anywhere between like 9 to what? 12 CP worth of value in a 9 CP card. Um, whereas there's a lot of cards that are around the 4 CP mark, 3 CP mark, 5 CP mark that are like, oh, cool, this card is 5 CP, but it gives, like, or it, this card is effectively, like, it's 3 CP card that gives you 5 CP worth of value. Or, like, here's effectively a 2 CP uh, forward um, that gives you, like, uh, uh, 4 CP worth of value, right? So you have to spend 9 CP to get maybe 12 CP worth of value, um, and you have to bank it up all in one go. So in regards to that, I think this card is like very cumbersome and the payoff isn't particularly big, right? And then after it's in play ability has like sort of resolved itself, um, it has no real ongoing impact. It's just a 9k body, right? Um, 
And even in the best case scenario where you are recurring its ability with say Renoa um, or Time Mages, you're spending CP to just like basically kill a guy and make a point to discard a card from your hand, right? But I still already have so many ways that they can just force your point to discard from your hand for very, very cheaply, whether it's like Argaf or Edward or Firmatur, right? Um, yeah, so like the first part, of, like doubling it up, doubling up Nidhogg, the first part of the ability is pretty irrelevant for Ice because Ice has plenty of ways of doing that already, right? Um, and then like the bottom ability of just killing all your points, guys, it's fine, but Ice already like has a way of dealing with forwards, whether it's like uh, destroying dull forwards, um, or dulling forwards or freezing forwards and so on. So um, I think Nidhogg, um, even in the best case scenario of doubling it up with Renault or Time Ages, um, even in those scenarios, I don't think it's particularly good. Um, if anything, Nidhogg, Nidhogg is not a control card. Um, as a combo card, it's a very weak combo card. And But if you consider it as like a value card, it's not even that much value, right? Um, you're not even getting that much value from this card by playing it. Um, so like if it was like, if it was like seven CP, then potentially I could see it being more play uh, useful. Um, or if it's a build, a secondary ability allows you to hit like monster back up or, or forward, um, that would give this card more utility. Um, but yeah, right now as it is, it just doesn't do enough, or it's not very, uh, it's not versatile enough. And because of that, I think that this card is quite weak. Um, and I think uh, Raze Velga is much better than Nidhogg um, in most situations. And that's it. We have done it. We have finished Opus Six. And we finished our set review of the set. Um, yeah, like obviously those light and dark cards, especially like Harry Zorger and Nidhogg, uh, people can be have very different opinions on that. So let me know what you guys think. Was I too harsh on Nidhogg or too praising on Harry Zorger? Um, yeah, if you guys have any interesting combos uh, or like decks you want to try to build, do let me know in the comment section below. I do respond to people, give feedback, and we, we can talk it out and stuff. Um, but yeah, if you, you guys enjoyed this video, please thumbs up and subscribe. Um, and yeah, I'll be doing a whole lot more deck videos in the near future. Probably a little bit of a little bit of time before I'll get my next video up. Probably it will be at the end of next weekend um, because I do have um, Australian Grand National Opens to to play. Um, but straight after that, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you guys the decks I was, the deck I was playing for the tournament. And uh, yeah, you guys can check out what serious decks you guys can bring into your uh, major tournaments coming up. But until then, thank you for watching, guys. Grand J out.